The measure of intelligence is the ability to change. Hi guys, Dr. Clark here again. Today's lecture we're going to talk about cellular respiration. In particular, we're going to talk about the process of glycolysis. So last time we were talking about photosynthesis and the Calvin cycle, or the calvin benson bassham cycle, and how glucose molecules are formed. Now we're going to talk about what happens to glucose molecules and how do you break them down in order to get energy from that glucose molecule. Okay? We talked about how it forms and how much energy has got to go in to form the glucose molecule, but now we're going to talk about how much energy can come out of that glucose molecule okay, through the different processes. So you can see here we're going to talk about three main processes. Glycolysis, which is taking glucose and converting it into pyruvate. We're going to talk about the Krebs cycle, which is taking pyruvate and converting it into acetyl-CoA, converting acetyl-CoA into different things. Okay. And then we're going to talk about the electron transport chain or electron transport system. And the ability for the electron transport system to take the products from the Krebs cycle and convert it, those into ATP. Okay? But today, we're just going to concentrate on glycolysis. All right, so where is the energy in food? Okay. Energy in food, we've talked about this many times, is bond energy. Energy is in two forms, potential energy and kinetic energy. And food is potential energy. It's bound energy, stored energy. When you eat the food, you break bonds. When you break bonds, you get energy. But what's that process look like from a molecular standpoint? That's what we're going to cover in the next few lectures. So electrons pass from atoms or molecules to another part of a system, and that's where the energy, or what, that's how the energy is utilized. We talked about this briefly in last lecture, and that was the terms oxidation and reduction. Oxidation is when an atom or a molecule loses an electron. That's what it's called, oxidation. When the atom or molecule gains an electron, electron it's called reduction. And that might not be intuitive to you because most people think reduce means to remove, but reduction is the gaining of an electron, so the gaining of energy, oxidation, is the loss of an electron or the loss of energy. Now the cool thing about this, and it shouldn't be a surprise to you, is that they occur always together. If you have a molecule or an atom that loses an electron, remember, nothing's created or destroyed. Energy's not created or destroyed, so if you have something that's going to lose it, then you have to have something that's going to gain it. Okay, So because they always occur together, when we know how the reaction works, we often call it a redox reaction or an oxidation reduction reaction, where one molecule is lo losing an electron, one molecule is gaining it, okay, and that's kind of how that reaction would work. So let's look at this kind of from an energy point of view. Redox reactions are, is just that. It's transferring energy from one molecule or atom to another molecule or atom. Now, when that occurs, the molecule that becomes oxidated or the molecule that loses an electron has less energy energy it has lower energy than the original molecule the molecule that gains an electron or is reduced has more energy 
than the original molecule. All right, so when this occurs, molecules change how much energy they have, how much potential energy they have by gaining an electron or losing an electron. Cellular respiration, the process that we're talking about, is taking stored chemical energy and breaking it down and utilizing the energy from that molecule, from that product. We often talk about it from a glucose standpoint because we talk about photosynthesis as generating glucose we talk about cellular respiration as reducing and oxidizing glucose. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean that the process is all that different if we're talking about proteins, or all that different if we're talking about nucleic acids, or all that different if we're talking about fatty acids. It's still very similar. There's just entry points for those other types of biomolecules. Proteins will enter at a different portion of cellular respiration cycle. Fatty acids would enter at a different portion of the cellular respiration cycle. Okay? So, but because carbohydrates have that direct connection with photosynthesis, that's what we're going to spend most of our time talking about. So the process can be simmer, summarized very similar to the equation that we looked at in photosynthesis. It's just nearly reverse of that equation. Now you have that glucose molecule. You take that, you add the oxygen. That's So now glucose is a product of plants. Oxygen is also a product of plants. It's a waste product, but it's still a product of plants. You take both of those. You have to add a little energy. We'll get to that. Add a little bit of energy. You're going to produce carbon dioxide, waste product. Water, sometimes a waste product. Depends on how much water you have. Okay, Often this is called metabolic water and energy in a couple forms. Energy in the form of heat, so some of that energy is just lost, and then energy in the form of ATP. Okay. And that energy can be utilized to drive work. All right, so let's start looking at cellular respiration. Let's dive into the different stages of cellular respiration mainly two stages. Now each one can be extremely complex. We're not going to dive into every single protein that's involved, but I just want you to realize when you eat some food, what is your body doing with that food? It's fairly important. The first process or the first stage is glycolysis. And that's what we're going to spend most of our time this lecture talking about. And that is going to be breaking down glucose molecules into pyruvate and getting the energy from that chemical bond. It occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell. So if you don't remember, the cytoplasm is the liquid around the organelles. So you have a cell and you have liquid all over inside that cell. That's called cytoplasm. So glycolysis occurs in that cytoplasm. It doesn't occur inside of an organelle. That's important because every single species, every single thing alive on this planet can do glycolysis. Everything can do glycolysis. Okay? And that is take glucose molecules and break them down. So it occurs in the cytoplasm. It also does not require oxygen to generate energy. This is key because this is what was going on on the earth prior to oxygen, oxygen being around. 
organisms could take glucose molecules or sugar molecules and they could break them up, generate energy, and they didn't need oxygen to do it. And then the second stage is the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle uses the product, one of the products, from glycolysis to drive the Krebs cycle. It occurs inside the mitochondria. Now, if it occurs inside the mitochondria, only organisms with a mitochondria can do the Krebs cycle. And that would be organisms that belong to eukarya. So they belong to one of the four kingdoms in eukarya. Fungi, protista, animalia, and plants. They can do the Krebs cycle. Bacteria and archaea cannot. They can only do glycolysis. That doesn't mean that they're not efficient. We'll talk about the efficiency and how they go about generating energy. It's a little bit different, okay? but they can only do glycolysis. The Krebs cycle is for eukaryotes only. It occurs within the mitochondria. It is utilizing the energy left over from glycolysis and the energy from other entry points. Proteins, fatty acids, nucleic acids will enter the Krebs cycle from different regions, okay, or different, different molecular pathways. The products of the Krebs cycle can then be utilized in the electron transport chain or electron transport system to generate ATP. We'll come back and look at that. So here's kind of how it works. Glucose goes through glu glu glycolysis, generates ATP. The product of glucose is ATP and pyruvate. Pyruvate then enters the mitochondria, goes through different processes. Pyruvate processes, pyruvate oxidation, pyruvate dehydrogenase. The enzymes will break pyruvate down create a molecule called acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA will enter the Krebs cycle. All along this whole path, intermediate electron carriers, just like in photosynthesis, are being generated. And those electron carriers can then dump into the electron transport chain and kick off ATP. Very, very similar to photosynthesis. Very similar to that proton pump, generating a proton gradient, driving ATP synthesis, it's very similar. We're going to concentrate on this portion out in the cytoplasm in this lecture. Okay, so glycolysis is a biochemical pathway. Biochemical pathway means you have different proteins and you have one protein that generates a product that product is used in another protein pathway. That generates a product, it's utilized in another pathway, it generates a product, etc. That's a biochemical pathway. The product of one reaction is used as the substrate in another reaction. There are 10 enzymes, 10 proteins that are used to break down six carbon glucose, okay? So remember, glucose chemical formula is C6H12O6. There are 10 enzymes needed to break it down into two molecules of three carbon pyruvate. Every time you break a bond, energy is released or the potential for energy to be released is there. Okay? That energy can then be driven or used to phosphorylate ADP to form ATP, just like in photosynthesis. When we use molecules like glucose to drive the formation of ATP, you're using chemical bonds and breaking chemical bonds to do that 
we call that substrate level phosphorylation. Okay, so you're breaking down material in a biochemical pathway to phosphorylate, to add a phosphate to ADP to form ATP. Also generated from the process is electrons being captured by an electron carrier and hydrogen ions. Okay. Instead of NADPH, which we see in plants, in this process, and so I shouldn't say in plants, okay? NADPH, which we see in photosynthesis, okay, because cellular respiration happens in plants also. They have mitochondria. In the mitochondria, what we see is it's not NADPH, it's NAD to form NADH, okay? A little different molecule, but the same general purpose, to carry electrons and protons, hydrogen ions, to a different region of either the mitochondria, to a different region of the cell, okay? They're electron carriers. They carry electrons, different regions, to do work in another place. All right, so let's look at the overview of glycolysis. Again, glucose is a six carbon molecule, C6H12O6. Take that glucose and you utilize ATP. We talked about this before when we were talking about potential energy, that a lot of times with potential energy, you gotta expend energy. You gotta push that rock so it rolls down the hill. You got to pedal that bike so you can get down that hill. So you have to use energy to break the potential energy to get kinetic energy. So here you can see energy is being used. ATP is being used. This ATP is stored ATP, stored from another source, okay, or the result of breaking glucose molecules before. That ATP is around. It is utilized. Right, that ATP is going to phosphorylate that six carbon molecule, forms six carbon sugar diphosphate. That six carbon sugar diphosphate can be broken into two three carbon sugar phosphates. That three carbon sugar phosphates can then be utilized. You can reconform them, you can change their bonds, remove their bonds capture the electrons coming off of them and the hydrogens coming off of them, generate some ATP, and form 3-carbon pyruvate. So at the end of glycolysis, you started with one glucose molecule, you expended, you used two ATP molecules, you get NADH, two molecules of ATP on, from one 3-carbon sugar phosphate, two molecules of ATP from another three carbon sugar phosphate, and three carbon pyruvates. Oh, two molecules of three carbon pyruvate, I'm sorry. Okay. Now, so your net gain of energy is pretty simple. You end up with four, but you already spent two. So from one glucose molecule going through glycolysis, you're only generating two ATP. There's a lot of energy in these pyruvates, and that's where the Krebs cycle comes in. Okay, so glycolysis, it yields a very small amount of ATP per glucose molecule, only two ATP per molecule of glucose. That being said though, this is the only way organisms can get energy in the absence of oxygen. Okay, when there's no oxygen, glycolysis is it. It's the only way you can convert glucose into ATP. When oxygen is present, you can carry out the Krebs cycle. Okay? So like I said before, every organism on the planet that is known to man can do glycolysis. So therefore, since everything can do it, and it's fairly simple, it's not super efficient, but it's fairly simple, and you can do it without oxygen, 
it's probably one of the earliest biochemical pathways to ever evolve. One of the very first ones to evolve because without it, there's no energy. Organisms can't have a metabolism. And that's one of the rules of being alive. You must have a metabolism. And so that process must be one of the very first to have evolved. You know, three and a half billion years ago, at least the precursors to this system were probably developed, evolved. Next time, we're going to talk about the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle. And this occurs when oxygen is present. You can see the top of this, that pyruvate, that's coming from glycolysis, which we just discussed. Okay, so next time, Krebs cycle.